everyone, and welcome to the Week 8 edition of NFL Soundbites. I'm Tom Moore, and as always, I'm joined by the game day color analyst for the Minnesota Vikings, Pete Bursich. And wow, Pete, uh, I thought we were just going to talk about the Bears' upset win over the Vikings on Monday night, but instead we got a bombshell announcement that North Turner retired this morning, effective immediately. And I'm curious, what are your thoughts about North stepping down like that, and how is it going to affect this team? Wow, I mean, that's a... That's Pandora's box, I think, right there. I mean, it was a, it's a surprise, no question about it. And uh, I just hope that it's nothing uh, you know, physical or anything like that that's, that's looming. Um, you know, it, it's just – there's a million ways to look at this, and I've been on the inside of, of situations like this. And, you know, coaches, coaches normally don't quit. You know, they're not, that's not in their blood. It's not in their DNA. Um, and so you, you can sit here all day and speculate as to what or why there are certain things that you can rule out. You know, you hear people talking about, well, the Vikings didn't make any moves at the trade deadline. I mean, things like that. I mean, that's that kind of stuff you can rule out. Coaches don't resign for, you know, for those reasons. Um, if that was the case, then, you know, probably every coach in the league would resign after free agency and everything else. They don't get what they want. Um, but you just don't know. I mean, you know, listening to Zimmer's press conference, he, he you know he was surprised. Um, so I guess I am too. I, I the, you know, again, these um, the truth is out there. Um, why and the exact reasons, but I don't, I don't think any of us will be privy to that information. And I think it'll remain you know, a mystery. And the bottom line is that uh, Shermer is going to take over as a play caller. And it's really interesting about this because even though he did uh, retire and it's shocking to everybody, there was starting to be a groundswell about this offense. A couple games looking kind of more bound there, couldn't run the ball. The offensive line is a known problem. And you mentioned Pat Shermer. He's now the interim offensive coordinator. And, and the good news about that, as you know, Pete, is you know Pat's been twice the offensive coordinator for Sam Bradford, once in St. Louis, and then again last year in Philadelphia. How much will his familiarity with Sam help this offense and help it in, the, in this transition away from North? It'll help quite a bit, and I think from a familiarity standpoint, he's used to Sam. He knows what he does well, what he doesn't do well, uh, and he could you know he could tailor that for the offense. You know that's stuff that, but those kinds of ideas and and, and those i those uh, concepts, you would think would have been implemented already. You you know what I'm saying you would think that with uh, Bradford coming in, uh, they would have sat down and said these are the things that uh, he does well, things he doesn't do well. So that part of it is a benefit but then again you would think like i said that they had already tried to do those things i mean i, I you know i don't know um it'll be interesting to see if, how much the offensive changes and people have to understand you can't just completely change an offense uh in a week and by the way this is a short week you know what i mean by the way this is a, this is a wednesday so this is a work day where the game plan has been done uh needs to have been done and has to be installed so you wonder did norv put this game plan together for this week or did he you know when did all this occur and I mean there's a lot of things that are questions in, in the short term and in the long term so uh but yeah the familiarity it does nothing but help uh but at the same time you know you can't just go Shermer can't go make this his offense right away you know there's just uh there's too much too much that he would probably have to and need to change and things there's a certain amount of things that just can't be done in a, that short period of time yeah, and you look at Shermer, I mean, the one big difference people say, they say his offenses kind of look like North Turner's. The big difference is he's more a little bit more conservative, likes the shorter passing game, which actually may help this team based on the inability to protect the quarterback. You would think, I mean, you would hope. Um, at, at some point, though, you have to be able to run the football effect, effectively or efficiently. And if uh, I think Bradford, you know, Bradford commented on this uh, in a press conference about how he he's seeing different coverages. He used to see a lot of man-to-man, eight-man boxes, things like that. And now he's seeing a lot more two deep and a lot more extra players deep, which basically what that means is that the defense is pulling a safety uh, or a DB out of run support and putting them deep in the, in the back end to have an extra body back there to defend the pass. And um, you have to have different route, different routes and different route sequences and combos to take advantage of those things. But normally what you do is you run the football. And uh, right now, if we can't run the football efficiently, even with defenses in a seven-man box and keeping safeties deep, 
uh, it's going to be very, very difficult for this offense to operate because you can't, you won't be able to do one thing and then set that up to exploit another. Uh, you're just going to have to, uh, you're going to be stuck trying to throw the foot. It's like trying, it's like you're being stuck trying to run in an eight man box. It doesn't always work. So now it's, it's like we've gone from Adrian Peterson can't, you know, we can't throw the ball. We got Adrian. We eight man, nine men in the box. Doesn't matter. We still got to run the football. Now we're facing seven men in the box. We can't run the ball. We have to throw it. So we have to throw it into a, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a less than ideal situation. So it's almost as if we've gone from one extreme to the other, and it's really just absolutely crazy. A lot of people are saying, "Boy, we really miss Adrian Peterson." But you know, when you look at Jarek McKinnon being out, uh, you, obviously Matt Asiata was playing the, the bulk of the game. No one's looked good. Even Adrian Peterson, before he went out, they were, there was just nowhere to run, and this team was built on that. And with a, with a Boone and, and, and a Fusco and and Berger in there, why can't they get any push in the middle? What's going on with what you see at the games? Well, I mean, the main thing is is just they can't move. They can't move the defensive line. They're losing a lot of one on one matchups and. Uh, you know, you, you, with a guy like Asiata who likes to steamroll, um, you know that's not that's not what that's not the way to be to run the football. Um, there's those, so many old cliches, and football so it has a lot of truisms on every level. But you have to reestablish the line of scrimmage, and our offensive line right now just can't do that. Every defensive line that we faced has looked stellar. We can't get guys off the point. We can't move them. Uh, we can't uh, do any of those things, and. So trying to run downhill and get a quick hitting style of running game when you have defensive linemen that are penetrating, getting on your line of scrimmage, it's just not going to bode very well. And unfortunately, you need a guy like a Barry Sanders or a Walter Payton if you're going to be yeah. in that kind of situation. Make his own holes. We have neither. Yep. When I look at that, I always think about you don't see the Vikings run trap plays. I mean, you can do a little bit of that. We don't see anybody. I haven't seen anybody pull around from a, a center tackle standpoint since Matt Burke has been here. Some of those things, I guess we don't have the athleticism, but maybe a four wide out positioning, you know, with a wide receiver, that would it spread the defense? That would that help? It would. It would help, I think, in the running game because then when you, you know, when you do that, when you spread it, when you spread out an offense. You, know, you spread out the defense does a couple things. Number one, it makes it easier for the quarterback to see what coverage he's what coverage he's getting. And uh, number two, yeah, it does pull all those all those other guys that can help and run support even late out of the box. So the number count does look good. I mean, yeah, and, but the problem is now is you can't when you go out of a full wide look, you no longer have a fullback uh, to block. You no longer have a tight end that can help block. So you're pulling guys like Zach Lyon out of the equation. And if your five-man offensive line is struggling already, um, now you're kind of isolating the problem, meaning that you've got four, you know, four defensive linemen against five offensive linemen and a linebacker. You can't get any help. So it's a tough situation to say, yeah, you can spread it out, pull some of the defenders out of the box. But if, you're, if your offensive line is, is the problem, uh, you're just magnifying it, so to speak, by having – O line versus the D line, and not being able to get any help from fullbacks or tight ends or anybody else that can step up and and do some blocking up front. It's funny you mentioned that because you, one of the things we look at this line is it, it looks worse than last year's piecemeal group. And and granted, our tackles they look like a mash unit right now. But you know the seemingly overmatched T.J. Clemmings, yeah, he almost beat out Andre Smith on the right side. And Matt Khalil, he wasn't necessarily tearing it up before he left on the left side. When you look at this, and a Boone, Boone was a great pass protector in San Francisco. He doesn't seem to be able to do that. Overall, you know the, the fan can't tell what's wrong with the line. Where where is the problems? Because they just seem to be getting beat all the way up and down. Well, it's you look at Bone. I think there are times when the pass protection is 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 still good. Um, but you you've got a guy like Fusco. Fusco's struggling in the run big time. Um, you know, he came into the season injured. Uh, he's not able to to really move much or move much of the pile. I think you've got T.J. Clemmings who's struggling with pass protection. Uh, I think you have um, uh, you know a uh, Berger who's done up until now, a pretty good job, uh, you know, both ways long is starting to come along. Um, you know, so you, you kind of have Boone has been a bit of an enigma. I still think he's been okay in the passing game, but he's not able to move the pile either. And with him coming out of a couple games early, you know, you wonder about his health, what's wrong with him, but he's not able to really tee off and move a pile in the run game either. So both your guards are struggling against the run. 
and then you have uh, two tackles who are struggling against the pass. So I think it's just a combination of of kind of everything. Um, so if you run, you got to worry about your guards. If you pass, you got to worry about your tackles, and that takes care of the inside run. And usually, your best pass rushers are defensive ends on the outside. I mean you're damned if you do damned if you don't it's a very very rough and tough combination to have you mentioned earlier i'm a little surprised that they haven't used a tight end to chip somebody like a, a david morgan who's a you know purported great blocker from college or even a red ellison to help out there why aren't they using them to help the tackle well they have i mean they they've done that i've, I've seen rudolph chip on his way out and uh you know what what's interesting is that when you do not have a mobile quarterback if you have a mobile quarterback um that changes things. And, and I guess let me explain. And the fact that when I looked at the bears game and they were chipping a few times, but the defensive end was not always rushing from the outside. He would loop underneath. Now, if you have a mobile quarterback and he sees that he can go ahead and buzz himself and get out of the pocket because there's no one out there for contain all the time. Well, uh, Bradford's a pocket passer. So, you know, the Vikings responded by chipping on the way out. No, oh, by the way, when you, chip on the way out you're limiting your pass routes so you take a Kyle Rudolph and put him in protection in the backfield or a running back and have those two guys chipping on their way out you've really limited the amount of routes that you can run you can't run uh, a lot of different routes when you have those guys not in the line of scrimmage and not being able to be in different formations the other thing again is that uh, the Bears answer to that when they saw that was they just didn't have the defensive end rush from the outside they had him come underneath and like I said, if you have a mobile quarterback, that usually allows them to escape and get out of the pocket and extend the plays. But Bradford isn't able to do that. He's he is a pocket passer, and we've we saw this with our own defense last year, and how we struggled with mobile quarterbacks, Rodgers of the world, you know those kinds of guys that can move. Um, but whenever we played a pocket passer, we always managed to do well. That's why I still think we'll do fine against the Detroit Lions. Um, because Stafford's a he's a pocket passer, so yeah, you had I mean you have these options, Tom, but you, you know there's always an answer to them, and and again you think yeah we'll chip on our way out, well the defenses go over, well, just not going to rush the end off, you know we're not just going to rush the end upfield by himself all the time, so you can chip the hell out of him. We're going to sneak him underneath or let him come underneath and let the three technique cover for him, and uh, so it's a it's a shell game, and and the Bears to their credit did a pretty good job of it. You've listened into fan line after a loss, and so you know how, how fans go from one extreme to the other based on that happened. And you mentioned Bradford, and some are starting to blame him. They're saying he, he's a problem. He doesn't look good. Well, I'll be honest with you, Pete. He looked great for four games, and he didn't look terrible in the two losses. I'm in that camp where Sam Bradford's probably more ready to lead a team at this stage than Teddy was. And I'm curious, what are your thoughts about Sam's performance? Yeah, he's a, he's a pocket passer. You see anything wrong with his game? Um. No, nah, I mean he he doesn't he he's not the same Bradford that we saw uh, the first four. I mean I, I just he's not he, he's 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 definitely a little more gun shy. Uh, he's definitely not hanging in there as long as he used to. But when you get sacked eleven times in two games, you can kind of understand you know how that's going to happen. But teams make adjustments. They do. They really do. They make adjustments and they make it harder uh, for you just to stand in the pocket and, and sling the ball around the yard. I mean. Don't forget, we had a wide open. We had a Stephon Diggs uh, reception or drop that should have been a, a catch, if not for a touchdown, and then it'd been deep in the red zone, and that could have changed the game. I mean, uh, that play right there. I mean, you, you look back at both of these games more so two weeks ago against Philly than this than last week against the Bears, but there were opportunities. Uh, Xavier Rhodes had his hands on a couple balls. You had a couple of real, you know, some real defensive breakdowns. Um, in the running game, mainly the first one in the running game, uh, where you just had a – they don't give up – defense doesn't give up runs for 40, 50 yards. They just – they haven't done that. And then you had the shovel pass, and uh, Xavier Rose just poked his arm out there instead of trying to make a tackle, which I think we have a few guys on defense that are nicked up right now, and, and they're just not playing at the level that they were. I think uh, Anthony Barr is one of them. Uh, he did not look himself – uh, Monday night, he didn't look like himself at all. And there were a lot of guys out there, I think. The defensive line, I think, is still playing at a level requisite, requisite of winning. That group is still playing at a very high level. Brian Robinson played very well. Uh, Linval Joseph is still playing well. Everson Griffin is still playing well. 
those guys are. I think it's the seven guys behind them that, um, you know, have fallen off the wagon a little bit, if you will. I mean, they're just, they're just not making the plays that they did earlier in the season. Yeah, and if you look at it, even they had some breakdowns on Monday night. I mean, this is still the number two ranked defense. They're zero point one yards behind the Cardinals right now, who are number one. So it's not like they've lost a lot. But you always said it: the first team to twenty-one. And the reality is, they give up twenty the last couple of weeks. So the reality, you know, it's it's they need that support from the offense. You're right, and that's the part that bothered me the most about the Bears game was that you know we gave up twenty points to an offense that's been struggling mightily all year to put points on the board and, and, you know, Cutler first game back, uh, started to get comfortable, started to get confident. And when that guy can scramble and just make things up and sling the ball around the yard and you're not intercepting them, uh, it's going to be a long night. It's going to be a real long night. And it was so defense has lost its swagger a little bit. It did Monday night. And that's the part that uh, concerns me the most. You can't allow as a defense, uh, when you take the field, for whatever reason, you have to take the field, period. You can't let, well, the offense has been three and out four or five times in a row affect the attitude that you have when you walk on the field. And I think it did a little bit Monday night. It's the first signs of it that I've, that I've seen. And some people will say, well, the defense is just sick of carrying the team or sick of the offense. I don't think it's that far yet, but I do think that there has been, there's an effect and and those guys just did not look like themselves for whatever reason. That defensive unit did not play at the intensity level and with the level of confidence that we've seen at least through the first uh, six games. Yeah, and obviously they, they had that intensity in the Philadelphia game and the, the offense couldn't capitalize on the turnovers. And you're right. I mean, you look at the 85 Bears, they didn't have much of an offense. And you look at the 2000 Ravens, they had almost no offense. That defense came to show up every single play, and it made a difference. Yeah, they did. They absolutely did. And that and it's it's tough. That's why for one of the main things and things that you'll see are these teams that get into the playoffs, the teams that do well, they have balance. Usually they have a top ten offense and a top ten defense. You don't see a lot of number one ranked offenses or defenses and, and then by you know, working together with a twentieth ranked uh you know, opposite side of the ball because it's just it, it's too much to ask that every week, week in and week out, that the either the offense or the defense dominates. And, uh, you know, I think we're, we're, the defense looked tired. They looked like they were wore out, so to speak. We, you know, teams in need of a home game. you got to get back home. It's a short week, though. That's tough. But, uh, you know, get a home game, it's going to help. I don't know if the crowd's going to be energized, if the crowd's going to be what they were. Um, but the Vikings are going to need to, you know, get out ahead early against Detroit to try to get the crowd back into it. And and go that route because you know these Lions they beat they, you know they beat the Eagles so don't think for a minute that this this Lions team is just going to roll over and play dead we all thought the Bears would at one and six well you now they didn't so don't expect these Lions to do that either. Not at all. They do have an offense over there. Hey, last question for you. Last week, we had an opportunity to talk to Chris Carter, and that, that had you and I looking at old uh, highlights of him and when you played. And, and Brian Billick was there when you played, and he would dial up the flea flicker, which we saw to Robert Smith, and or even a wide receiver to wide receiver pass. I'm curious. The Vikings really don't have the personnel to be a smash-mouth team, but we kind of operate that way. Why don't we see some more of that creativity? I mean, I know we're changing offensive coordinators, but have you ever wondered why they don't put some of that back in the game plans? Well, one of the things for sure, and this goes for punt returners, um, this goes for anybody that you want it to run a, a gadget play with, like a flea flicker or something like that, is you really have to trust the judgment of the player. I think Jarek McKinnon is the kind of guy that can do that. That's why when you line him up in the Wildcat, uh, you can't really just um, ignore or eliminate the possibility of throwing the football. But uh, when you have other guys in there, I mean, Asiata, I don't think is the kind of guy that uh, you're going to trust in throwing the football or having a run pass type option, that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, gadgets are, are always a part of an offense and, and they, you should, you should run them occasionally every once in a while to, to just keep defenses off balance, uh, whether it be in the red zone on the goal line or around midfield, you, you know, they help, they work. And that's something that Billick used. Uh, used very and you know, used it very effectively, but again, you had a Robert Smith to a Randall Cunningham. I mean, you had guys that you could really trust, and that's the key. 
and you have to have an offensive line that can hold up if you're going to run something like that. So you run a flea flicker and you got three D linemen loose. I mean, that's not going to go anywhere. You see what I mean? And that's the hard part about coaching, man. When when you have a part of your part of your defense or offense that's struggling, it 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 climbs into your game planning. It climbs into your play calling. I mean, it really it affects the coaches too. And uh, you know, it, it's hard to uh, you can't ask guys to do more than they're capable of doing. And so when uh, you know you get fans that say, why don't you do this and do that? It's like, well, I'm sure they've thought about it. It's just for whatever reason, they don't feel comfortable doing it. Uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, at least they, maybe they'll benenefit from the home cook and get back on the win column. There are, there's still a game up on Packers, effectively a game and a half because they beat them already. And with that, Pete, you know, that brings the end of this edition of NFL Soundbites. And, and I specifically want to make sure the fans don't forget to interact with you on the NFL, the Vikings, or even the greatness of wrestler Ric Flair on Twitter, at Pete Bursich. So until next week, with the news around the NFL, for Pete Bursich, I'm Tom Moore. So long, everyone. 